Are you ready to get into Yah's Word? Amen. I am as well. I want you to open your Bibles with me to 1 Timothy chapter 6. We're going to begin with verse 3 in just a moment, and we're calling this message, actually it's a series, we're calling it, Was Paul Really Anti-Torah? I don't know about you, but I was taught by religion that, that you know, Paul observed the Torah before he met Yeshua, but then after he met Yeshua, after he was born again, then he quit observing the Torah, and uh, as a matter of fact, he then abolished the Torah. I've heard people tell me that the book of Romans is the book that Paul uses to abolish the Torah, and that amazes me, because if you would only go in and check how many times Paul quotes the Torah in the book of Romans, you would be amazed. Hallelujah. So we're going to look at a few verses to discover, was Paul really anti-Torah? And we're going to start with 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 3. It says, if anyone teaches differently, everybody say differently, and does not agree, say does not agree, to the sound words. Everybody say sound words. Now, sound words, what, what, what do those two words together mean? It means true doctrine. Sound words, true doctrine, whole and healthy without corruption. All right. If anyone teaches differently and does not agree to the sound words, those of our master Yeshua Messiah and to the teaching, which is according to reverence. Look at verse four. He is puffed up. That means proud and arrogant, understanding none at all. He understands nothing, but is sick about questionings. In other words, this person has an unhealthy appetite for arguments and verbal battles, which means verbal disputes over insignificant things from which come envy, strife, slander, wicked suspicions, worthless disputes of men of corrupt minds and deprived of the truth who think that reverence is a means of gain. Notice what he says, withdraw from such. Now you need to keep in mind, this is Paul speaking. Paul says, if there's anyone who teaches differently than Yeshua, if there's anyone who teaches something that does not agree with Yeshua's doctrine. Paul even says that Yeshua's teachings are sound words. That's where all sound doctrine comes from, Yeshua's teachings. It's amazing. Some people say, well, Yeshua was under the law and he taught people under the law, but we're not under the law, so we don't really listen to Yeshua. Yeshua didn't say, follow some other man. He didn't say, follow Paul. He said, follow me. We're going to find out in these scriptures today that, that Paul said that if you imitate him, you will be imitating Yeshua because Yeshua is the one that Paul imitates. Amen? So Paul said, if there's anyone who teaches differently or anyone who teaches something that doesn't agree with the sound words of Yeshua, he says, withdraw from such. So think about it, because religion wants to say that Paul taught something different than Yeshua. That Paul's teachings don't agree with Yeshua's. That Yeshua had a doctrine, but now we don't follow Yeshua's doctrine, we follow Paul's doctrine. Well, according to Paul's own words, if he teaches differently, if he teaches in a way that doesn't agree, if he teaches some other doctrine, then we must withdraw from Paul. Amen. So what does that mean to us? That means that Yeshua's doctrine and Paul's doctrine will always agree. Amen. That when you read the writings of Paul, you can always know Paul is never going to teach something that disagrees with Yeshua's teachings. Can you say amen? amen. Well, then what did Yeshua teach about the Torah? If, if our question today is, was Paul really anti-Torah? We know that Paul's always going to agree with Yeshua's teachings, then what did Yeshua teach about Torah? Go over to Matthew chapter 5, starting with verse 17, and notice what Yeshua said here. Do not think that I came to destroy, that word means demolish, dissolve, bring to naught, overthrow, or throw down. In other words, do away with, terminate, or abolish. Do not think I came to destroy the Torah or the prophets. Okay, so that's point one. Before we go any further, we need to establish that Yeshua said, I did not come to destroy or to 
abolish the Torah or the prophets. Write it at the top of your page in bold caps that Yeshua did not come to destroy or abolish the Torah or the prophets. Let that be the main theme of what he's going to say here, okay? I did not come to destroy. I did not come to demolish, to dissolve, to bring to naught, to overthrow, to throw down, but to complete. Now, your Bible may say fulfill. All right. So if you get into the original language, that word means to fill it up, to fill it up, like filling a glass of water to the full, to expand it to its deeper spiritual application. Now, I'm going to be able to bear that out as we continue in this sermon. So Yeshua said, I didn't come to destroy it. Don't ever get that thought in your mind. How many of you have ever had that thought? Because religion taught you that Yeshua came to obey it so that he could then abolish it. That's a common thought in Christian religion, that he obeyed it fully so that he could then abolish it. But isn't it interesting that Yeshua begins this discourse by saying, don't even let that thought cross your mind. Don't even let that thought enter your mind that I came to abolish the Torah. I didn't come to abolish it, but I came to fill it up. I came to expand it to its deeper spiritual application. Find an interesting passage in Isaiah, Isaiah 42, 21, that says, It has delighted Yah for the sake of his righteousness to make the Torah great and esteemed. In other words, to exalt the Torah and make it glorious or to fill it up. That's what Yeshua did. He didn't come to destroy it or abolish it. He came to fill it up, to expand it to its deeper spiritual application. Now look at verse 18. It says, For truly I say to you, till the heaven and the earth pass away. Now why did he use the heaven and the earth? Because the heaven and the earth are Yah's witnesses to the Torah. Okay, as long as the witnesses exist, so does the Torah. You say, prove that out. All right, I will. Deuteronomy chapter 30, starting with verse 15. It says, see, I have set before you today life and good and death and evil, in that I am commanding you today to love Yah, your Elohim, to walk in his ways and to guard his commands and his laws and his right rulings, and you shall live and increase and Yah, your Elohim, shall bless you in the land which you go to possess. But if your heart turns away and you do not obey and shall be drawn away and shall bow down to other mighty ones and serve them, I have declared to you today that you shall certainly perish. You shall not prolong your days in the land which you are passing over the yard to enter and possess. Verse 19 I have called the heavens and the earth as witnesses today against you. I have set before you life and death, the blessing and the curse. Therefore, you shall choose life so that you live, both you and your seed. So what did he actually set before them? He set before them the Torah. And he says, you can choose to obey it or you can choose to disobey it. If you choose to obey it, it'll bring life and blessing. If you choose to disobey it, it will bring death and, and the curse. But, but who were the witnesses to this declaration? Heaven and earth. Heaven and earth are the witnesses. That's why Yeshua says in verse 18 of, of Matthew 5, For truly I say to you, till the heaven and the earth pass away. One yod. All right, what is a yod? It's the smallest of the Hebrew letters in the Hebrew Aleph Bet. All right, it's the smallest. It's a little tiny letter, like a little comma. One yod or one tittle. A tittle are the little decorative embellishments on the Hebrew letters. Now, Yeshua is talking about letters. He's not talking about the oral law. He's talking about the written Torah. Amen. So he says, not one yo, not the smallest of, of the letters or the tiny decorative markings on the letters shall by no means, what does that mean? Not at all, pass from the Torah till all be done, all right? What does that word mean? Again, your Bible may say till all is fulfilled, all right? It means until all has come to pass. So not one letter our decoration will pass from the Torah until everything written in the Torah and the prophets has come to pass. So let me ask you a question. Are there prophetic verses 
in the Torah and the prophets that have yet to come to pass? Of course there are. Amen? So how foolish it would be for there to be prophetic writings that pertain to the future and that for some reason the Almighty just decided to abolish those prophetic writings. No, that's not what he did. Amen? And Yeshua said that not one yod or tittle will pass from the Torah till all has come to pass. All right? Now, Psalm 119, 160, what does it say to us? The sum of your word is truth. How much of Yah's word is truth? The sum, all of it. So has the, has the largest body of biblical material, the original Hebrew scriptures, now become untruth? Or is it still truth? Still truth. The sum of your word is truth. And all your righteous right rulings are forever. For how long? Forever. Now, does forever no longer mean forever? Now that Yeshua died and was buried and raised and ascended, is, does forever still mean forever? All right. So all of Yah's word is truth and all of the righteous right rulings are forever. All right. So nothing's going to pass. As long as the witnesses exist, the heavens and the earth, Yah's word remains. It is truth and it is truth forever. All right. Look at verse 19. Whoever then breaks, that word breaks means to destroy or to dissolve, to put off, in essence, to abolish. Whoever then breaks one of the least of these commands. All right. The smallest of these commands Yeshua is talking about. Now, we're going to have to define these commands here in just a minute. But he says, whoever then breaks one of the least of these commands and teaches men so shall be called least. That word means small in the reign of the heavens. But whoever does and teaches them, he shall be called great or large and significant in the reign of the heavens. So Yeshua is making it very clear. Whoever breaks or destroys or dissolves or puts off or abolishes one of the least of these commandments. Now, the, the Pharisees like to kind of size up the commandments by great commandments and, and lesser commandments and all of that. And, and Yeshua is just saying, okay, I know you have it in your head that some commandments are greater than other commandments. But he says, if anyone abolishes and teaches others to abolish the least of these commandments, then he shall be least in the kingdom. But the one who does these commandments and teaches them, he will be called great in the reign of the heavens. Verse 20, for I say to you that unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you shall by no means enter into the reign of the heavens. And the sin of the scribes and the Pharisees was the sin of hypocrisy. They, they said they loved Yah, but they abolished certain written commandments for the sake of keeping their man-made traditions. And maybe they thought, well, this is just a small commandment, so, so we can abolish this for the sake of keeping our man-made traditions. And Yeshua said, if you abolish one of the least of these commandments, and he's, and he's pointing to the written word, he's pointing to the written Torah, then you will be least in the kingdom. If you do them and teach them, you'll be great in the kingdom. But if you sin the sin of hypocrisy where you love your man-made traditions more than the truth, you won't even enter the kingdom. Yeah. Hallelujah. So what commandments is Yeshua talking about when he says these commandments? You say, why are you asking that question? Because I, I know how people think. And some people will, will say, well, he's just talking about the Ten Commandments. Well, let's find out what he's talking about by looking into the text. We need to define the commandments that have not passed away, but have been filled up by Messiah. Look at Matthew chapter 5, verse 21. Yeshua then is talking about these commandments. You heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not murder. Now, where, where did that come from? 
Exodus chapter 20, verse 13, Deuteronomy chapter 5, verse 17. It's the sixth commandment of the Ten Commandments. So obviously he starts with one of the ten words. And whoever murders shall be liable to judgment. Look at the next few words in verse 22. But I say to you that whoever is wroth or angry with his brother without a cause shall be liable to judgment. So here's the question. Is Yeshua abolishing this commandment that prohibits murder? Is he diminishing it in any way? No, what is he doing? He is filling it up because he's taking it beyond just the action of the hand. And now it's about the activity of the heart. See, you shall not murder. If you just took it from a literal view would be don't go take the life of your brother. But Yeshua says, if you have anger in your heart toward your brother, in essence, you've already murdered him. You've committed the sin. That's filling the commandment up. That's not lowering the standard. That's raising the standard. That's lifting the bar. That's exalting the Torah. Amen? That's exalting the commandment to its higher spiritual application. So we know he's talking at least about the Ten Commandments because he starts with one of the Ten Commandments. Look at verse 27. You heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not commit adultery. Well, that's another one of the Ten Commandments, is it not? Exodus chapter 20, verse 14, Deuteronomy chapter 5, verse 18. It's the seventh commandment of the Ten Commandments. But I say to you that everyone looking at a woman to lust for her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Again, it's not just a hand issue. It's a heart issue. The law has been exalted. It's no longer Moshe saying, here are the commandments out here. Don't do these things. The, the new covenant says that the Almighty inscribes his law on our hearts. He takes it inside. He internalizes it. Now he's looking at your heart. He's judging your heart before your hand ever does anything. He looks at your heart. And you can sin in your heart before your hand ever commits a sin. He exalts it. But I say to you that everyone looking at a woman to lust for her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. And then look at Matthew chapter 5, verse 31. And it has been said, whoever puts away his wife, let him give her a certificate of divorce. Now, where did he get that? That's Deuteronomy chapter 24, verse 1. All right. Is that one of the Ten Commandments? No, it's not one of the Ten Commandments, but it is a Torah commandment. So when Yeshua is defining these commandments, he's not limiting that to the ten words, to the ten commandments. He's now expanded it into the Torah. Look at verse 32. But I say to you that whoever puts away his wife, except for the matter of whoring, makes her commit adultery. And whoever marries a woman who has been put away commits adultery. So he expounds upon this command and he brings clarity. All right, he fills it up. So the subject of today's message is not divorce and putting away and all of that. But I just wanted to show you he's talking now about Torah commandments, not just Ten Commandments. Look at verse 33. Again, you heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not swear falsely, but shall perform your oaths to Yah. All right, that's Leviticus 19, verse 12, Numbers 30, verse 2, Deuteronomy chapter 23, verse 21. And none of these are listed in the Ten Commandments, but these are Torah commandments. Verse 34, but I say to you, do not swear at all. All right, so the Hebrew text of the book of Matthew includes the word shah, which means vainly. So it, it may have been that they had gotten into a lot of vain swearing, just swearing about a lot of different things. And, and notice what it says in the rest of the verse here, neither by the heaven because it is Elohim's throne, nor by the earth, for it is, it is his footstool, nor by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great sovereign, nor swear by your head, because you're not able to make one hair white or black. So they're swearing by all kinds of things, vainly swearing, swearing about whatever, in the name of the heavens or the earth or Jerusalem or their head, 
And, and so Yeshua is, is going to expound upon this practice. And he says in verse 37, but let your word, yes, be yes. And your no be no. And what goes beyond these is from the wicked one. In other words, stop all this vain swearing. You're taking oaths on all of these different things, heaven, earth, Jerusalem, your head. He says, stop all that. We need to get back to just making your yes be your yes and your no be your no. Now, what do we know that he knows? We know he knows the Torah. What do we know that he obeyed? We know he obeyed the Torah. So what does the Torah say about making oaths? Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 13. Fear Yah, your Elohim, and serve him, and swear by his name, not vainly on all these other things. All right, so the, the main point I want to make here is that he's talking about Torah commandments, these commandments. Those that abolish these commandments and teach others to abolish them will be least in the kingdom. Those who obey them and teach others to obey them will be great in the kingdom. What commandments? Yes, the Ten Commandments, but also Torah commandments. All right, look at verse 38. You heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. That's Exodus 21, verse 24. It's not one of the Ten Commandments, but it is a Torah commandment. But this was a principle for the judges to apply. All right, so people didn't get to go around, oh, you hit me in the mouth, so I'm going to hit you in the mouth. You know, you, you knocked out one of my teeth, so I'm going to knock out yours. You know, the judges would make that judgment. The judges would make that decision. All right. But it wasn't, it wasn't the, the citizen's role to make those judgments. All right. So Yeshua is going to expound upon this bit, a bit. Look at verse 39. But I say to you, do not resist the wicked. But whoever slaps you on your right cheek, turn the other to him also. All right. So, so don't go around trying to exact judgment the way you think it ought to be exacted. That's for the judges. But, but how, does the, how does the believer, how does the Torah follower uh, live his life as it relates to those around him? Don't resist the wicked. If someone slaps you on your right cheek, turn the other to him also. So that's Yeshua expounding and bringing clarity. All right, here's another one. Matthew chapter 5, verse 43. You heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor. That's Leviticus 19, verse 18. It's a Torah commandment, not one of the Ten Commandments. And hate your enemy. All right, so hate your enemy was a spoken teaching, but it wasn't a part of the written Torah, okay? But Yeshua says, I say to you, love your enemies, Bless those cursing you, do good to those hating you, and pray for those insulting you and persecuting you so that you become sons of your Father in the heavens. So love your neighbor is most definitely a Torah command. Hate your enemy is, is, was a teaching uh, of, of the rabbis of that day. And Yeshua said, look, I want you to love your enemies. I want you to bless those cursing you. Do good to those hating you. Pray for those insulting you and persecuting you. And that way you'll be like your father. You'll be sons of your father in the heavens. So the, these commandments of Matthew 5 are, yes, the Ten Commandments, but they're also the Torah commandments. Now, Yeshua taught this. So if Paul teaches anything different or if he disagrees with Yeshua's teaching on the Torah, then according to Paul's own words, we have to withdraw from Paul. So what that tells you is when you're reading Paul's writings, you could always know that Paul's going to be in agreement with Yeshua's teachings. He always will. Amen. So go with me over to Romans. Chapter 3, we're going to begin with verse 28. And let's see if what Paul taught about the Torah is in line with Yeshua's teachings about Torah. Romans chapter 3, beginning with verse 28. For we reckon that a man is declared right by belief without works of the Torah. We know that we're justified by 
grace through faith, your English Bible may say. By favor through belief in Yeshua alone. And not by works of Torah apart from belief. Verse 29. Or is he the Elohim of the Yehudim only? Those who had the Torah. And not also of the nations. Yes, of the nations also. Since it is one Elohim who shall declare right the circumcised, the Jews, by belief. And the uncircumcised, the Gentiles, through belief. Look at verse 31. Do we then nullify the Torah through the belief? Does our belief in Yeshua nullify or abolish the Torah? What does he say? Let it not be. On the contrary. In other words, the opposite is true. We, meaning our belief in Yeshua, establish the Torah. So Paul teaches that the Torah is established by our belief, not abolished by our belief. Is that in line with Yeshua's teaching? Yes, because he always agrees with Yeshua. Was Paul trying to start some new thing? Who did Paul imitate? Yeshua. Let me bear that out in Scripture. Go with me over to Romans chapter 1, beginning with verse 1. This is the book where... Religion says that Paul uses this book to abolish the Torah. But notice what Paul says about himself. Romans chapter 1, verse 1. Shaul, a servant, your Bible may say a slave, of Yeshua Messiah. So Paul is a servant or a slave of Yeshua. A called emissary. That means a sent out one. Well, who sent him out? Yeshua. When an emissary goes out, who does he represent? The one who sent him out. He's not going to go out and teach something contrary to the doctrine of the one who sent him. You see how ridiculous that is. To think he's going to teach something different than what Yeshua taught. Shaul, a servant of Yeshua Messiah, a called emissary, separated to the good news of Elohim, which he promised before through his prophets in the set-apart scriptures concerning his son, who came of the seed of Dawid according to the flesh, who was designated son of Elohim with power according to the set-apart spirit by the resurrection from the dead, Yeshua Messiah, the master of us. So who's the master? Does this sound like somebody that's trying to start up something on his own, do something completely different? Or does this sound like a sent out emissary of the master? He declares he's the master of us all. Amen. Through whom we have received favor and office of the emissary for belief obedience. Everybody say belief obedience. That means obedience because you believe. Among all the nations on behalf of his name. Whose name? Yeshua among whom you also are the called ones of Yeshua Messiah. So Paul was very clear who the master was and whom we are to follow. Amen? 1 Corinthians 11.1 1 says, Become imitators of me. This is Paul writing. As I also am of Messiah. So again, Yeshua said, follow me. Have you noticed he never said follow religion? He certainly didn't say follow me until I die and buried and raised and ascend to the Father and then follow Paul. Did he say that? He said follow me. By the way, how many of you want to end up where Yeshua ended up? How many of you want to follow the one that made it? He made it to the right hand of the Father. How many of you want to follow the one that made it? He did not abdicate his position of shepherd. He's still shepherding his sheep. Amen. And Paul is a sheep of the shepherd. He didn't abdicate his position. Paul didn't take by force that role. He's in complete agreement with Yeshua. 
He said, become imitators of me as I also am of Messiah. I'm imitating Messiah. Now look at 2 Peter chapter 3, beginning with verse 16. And this is a very interesting passage because this is a passage of Scripture that warns us prophetically that there will be people in every generation who are untaught and unstable who will twist Paul's writings to their own destruction. I find that really interesting that within the body of Scripture, there's a warning. Be careful because people in every generation, the untaught and the unstable, are going to twist what Paul wrote and make it say something that he didn't say. In other words, they're going to make Paul disagree with Yeshua. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 16 as also in all his letters, speaking in them concerning these matters, in which some are hard to understand. Peter says, Paul's writings can be hard to understand. Now this is Peter, who's an apostle, and he says some of Paul's writings can be difficult to understand. How about just the common person? So we have to be careful when we're reading Paul. We, we truly have to be led by the Spirit to understand what Paul's really saying. Peter says some of his writings are hard to understand, which those who are untaught and unstable twist to their own destruction. See, some people are going to twist Paul to the place to where that twisting or perversion of Scripture is going to destroy them. They twist Paul's writings to their own destruction as they do also the other scriptures. You then, beloved ones, being forewarned. See, here's the warning in scripture. You've been forewarned. Say, I've been warned. Watch, it says, lest you also fall from your own steadfastness, being led away with the delusion of the lawless. I find that really interesting. Interesting. There is a delusion that's put forth by the lawless. And their whole goal is to draw people away into lawlessness. All of mankind can be divided into two groups. Those who follow the lawless one or the mystery of lawlessness, the work of lawlessness that's in the earth even today. And the lawless one, the anti-Messiah, isn't it interesting that he's defined by those terms? He's lawless. And then there's Yeshua, the righteous one, who obeyed completely. And we're supposed to follow his example. Isn't that right? So you have the lawless one and those that follow lawlessness. And then you have the righteous one and those who follow Yeshua into obedience. So what camp do you want to be in? We don't want to be led away with the delusion of the lawless. Now, how many of you believe that there is a delusional force in the earth today? And it's very active in what's called religion. And there are people who are heaping upon themselves teachers that will give them what their itching ears want to hear. They're doing it to satisfy their flesh. But there is a work of lawlessness that's behind the whole thing. Amen. And some of the doctrines in modern religion are so appealing and so attractive. Amen. You know, they just sound so good. And I would like to think it was that way. But it leads people into lawlessness. And you hear people say all the time, I've been set free. I'm free. And they sing songs about being free. You know, I'm, I'm free, but free from what? <laughs> Many of them believe they're free from the law, from the Torah, from the instructions of the Almighty. They think they're free. We're supposed to be free from sin. What is sin? Transgression of the Torah. 
See, people want to get rid of the Torah because they don't want law. Yeshua is the righteous one. Yeshua is the one who obeyed perfectly. And he says, follow me. Will we make mistakes? Of course, but we're going to follow him. And we're going to trust in his redemptive work. The fact that his blood washes us. The fact that we have a high priest that we can call upon when we miss the mark. And he goes before the Father and advocates for us, not based on what we did or didn't do, but based on what he accomplished when he died in our place on the tree and was buried and raised. When we come humbly before him and we confess our sins, he goes before the Father. The Father has no other recourse once he is reminded of the blood and the sacrifice but to forgive us of our sins. Hallelujah. Then we get up from that place and we go on and we produce more obedience that leads to righteousness. Can you say amen? amen. Hallelujah. Verse 18 says, But grow in the favor and knowledge of our Master and Savior, Yeshua Messiah. To Him, to Yeshua, be the esteem both now and to a day that abides. In other words, forever. So, so Peter is not thinking, now we follow Paul. He's talking about Yeshua. Grow in the favor and knowledge of the Master. Our Master and Savior, Yeshua Messiah. To Him, Yeshua, be the esteem both now and forever. Amen. So Peter wasn't confused about who to follow. So let's talk about some of the issues that you hear a lot of in, in religion. Go with me over to Luke chapter 6, beginning with verse 16. We know that Paul is always going to agree with Yeshua's teaching. So what was Paul's position on the Sabbath? Because people want to say that Paul set a new precedent for Sunday worship. That it was Paul who started Sunday worship, that, that after he got born again, he quit observing the Sabbath and started this new policy of worshiping on Sunday morning. Well, we know his position is going to line up with Yeshua's position, is it not? Luke chapter 4, starting with verse 16, this is Yeshua's position. And he, Yeshua, came to Nazareth where he had been brought up. Look at the next few words. And according to his practice. Now this is Luke. Luke uh, authored his good news. And according to his practice. Whose practice? Yeshua's practice. He went into the congregation on the Sabbath day. That's the seventh day Sabbath as defined by the Torah. And stood up to read. So we know it was Yeshua's practice. Every week of his life it was Yeshua's practice. To worship on the seventh day Sabbath. Luke says it was his practice. Now look at Acts chapter 17 beginning with verse 1. Let's see if Paul's practice lines up with Yeshua's practice. And having passed through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessaloniki where there was a congregation of the Yehudim or our synagogue. Verse 2. Notice, and according to his practice. Luke is saying the same thing about Paul. Because Luke is the author of the book of Acts. He's saying the exact same thing that he said about Yeshua. That Paul's practice was to worship on the seventh day Sabbath. Now you can go through the book of Acts and we're not going to do it today. And, and you'll see scripture after scripture after scripture where Paul was in the synagogue on the seventh day Sabbath. You have a huge body of evidence that bears out that Paul didn't change his Sabbath to Sunday. Now you hear today, you have people in religion that want to say, well, the Sabbath is simply a, a principle. Have you noticed which commandment has more words in it? Just sheer body of material, more specifics than any other commandment. It's the fourth commandment. It's the Sabbath commandment. 
Y'all spends more time being very clear about the seventh day Sabbath than in any of the other commandments. And yet that's the one that religion wants to take and give all kind of latitude to and say, well, that the Sabbath is a principle, that, that just one day out of seven you need to rest, and my Sabbath is on Sunday, or my Sabbath is on Wednesday, or my Sabbath is on Thursday, whatever it might be. And yet the Almighty was very specific about the seventh day Sabbath in his commandments, the Ten Commandments. All right, look at verse 2, Acts 17. And according to his practice, Paul's practice, Shaul went in unto them and for three Sabbaths was reasoning with them from the Scriptures, explaining and pointing out that the Messiah had to suffer and rise again from the dead, saying, This is the Messiah, Yeshua, whom I proclaim to you. Again, Paul's position on the Sabbath was the same as Yeshua's. No different. All right, what about the feast? Let's just take a few minutes and, and talk about the feast. Did, did Shaul, did Paul continue to keep the feast even after the resurrection and the ascension of Yeshua? Religion will say he didn't. But what does the scripture say? Acts chapter 18, starting with verse 19. And he came to Ephesus and left them there, but he himself went into the congregation and reasoned with the Yehudim. And when they asked him to stay a longer time with them, he declined, but took leave of them, saying, I have to keep this coming festival in Jerusalem by all means, but I shall come back to you, Elohim desiring so. And he sailed from Ephesus. All right. So this is after the resurrection. This is after the ascension. And Paul is telling the brethren that he's got to get back to Jerusalem by all means to keep this upcoming festival. So he kept feasts after the resurrection and the ascension. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7. He's going to use festival terminology in dealing with an issue here in, in the congregation in Corinth. It says, therefore, cleanse out the old leaven so that you are a new lump as you are unleavened. For also Messiah, our Pesach, or Passover, was slaughtered for us. Look, if Paul wanted to abolish all of this, if he wanted to, to be the precursor of, of setting into motion all the upcoming Roman holidays that religion keeps today, then, then why is he using festival terminology? Why is he still talking about it? He's saying that Messiah is our Passover. He's saying cleanse out the old leaven. That's what you do during the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Now look at verse 8. So then, he's speaking to the congregation of belief in Corinth. So then let us celebrate the festival. He's actually charging the congregation of belief in, in Corinth to keep or to celebrate the festival. To celebrate Passover, Feast of Unleavened Bread. Notice, not with old leaven, nor with the leaven of evil and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. So I don't know how you get around that. That, that is a charge from Paul to the fellowship of believers in Corinth to celebrate the festival. In Acts chapter 20, verse 6, says, and we sailed away from Philippi after the days of unleavened bread and came to them at Troas in five days where we stayed seven days. So, so Luke is saying that they sailed away from Philippi after the days of unleavened bread. Again, if, if they're trying to dissolve this, to abolish this, to, to uh, institute something new, then, then why are they talking about the Feast of Unleavened Bread and using it as a point in time that they left Philippi after the days of unleavened bread. The implication is they celebrated the Feast of Unleavened Bread in Philippi. These are believers in Yeshua. This is after the resurrection and the ascension. 
So it goes on to say that Paul was hurrying to get back to Jerusalem to celebrate the Feast of Shavuot. That's Acts chapter 20, verse 16. For Shaul had decided to sail past Ephesus so that he might lose no time in Asia, for he was hurrying to be at Jerusalem, if possible, on the day of the festival of Shavuot. So he was hurrying to get back to Jerusalem to celebrate the Feast of Shavuot. Doesn't sound to me like he's trying to abolish the festivals. Not from his own experience that we read about in the book of Acts. Now go with me quickly over to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. We're going to begin with verse 15. And I'm going to show you how Paul uses Yom Teruah and Sukkot terminology in his writings. Okay, Yom Teruah, the, the day of soundings. And Sukkot terminology. For this we say to you by the word of the master, that we, the living, who are left over at the coming of the master, shall in no way go before those who are asleep, because the master himself shall come down from heaven with a shout. This is Yom Teruah, folks. With a voice of a chief messenger, an archangel. And with the trumpet, the trumpet blast of Elohim. This is Yom Teruah terminology. And the dead and Messiah shall rise first. Then we, the living, who are left over, shall be caught up or caught away together with them in the clouds to meet the master in the air. And so we shall always be with the master. Yah with us. Sukkot terminology. So even in his teaching about the second coming of Yeshua, he's using festival terminology. Because the feast picture, the fall feast picture, what's going to happen at the second coming. Amen. The spring feast pictured what Yeshua would accomplish in his first coming. He accomplished all those things perfectly. He's going to accomplish all of the things that his second coming perfectly as it relates to the festivals. Quickly, Acts chapter 27, verse 7. This is Yom Kippurim terminology. And having sailed slowly many days and arriving with difficulty off Nidos, the wind not allowing us to proceed, we sailed close to Crete off Salmoni. And passing it with difficulty, we came to a place called Fair Havens near the city of Lasea. And much time having passed, and the sailing now being dangerous, look at the next few words, because the fast was already over. What fast is he talking about? The fast at Yom Kippurim. Again, using the festival as a point in time. Luke says the fast was over. Again, if, if they're wanting to abolish this, then why are they still talking about it, referring to it, because the fast was already over. Shaul advised them, saying, men, I see that this voyage is going to end with damage and great loss and so on and so forth. So I want to end with one final passage. This is Colossians chapter 2, beginning with verse 16. And this is one terribly misinterpreted verse that makes Paul seem anti-Torah. So what we've discovered is Paul's writings are always going to agree with Yeshua's. We've discovered that there will be untaught and unstable people throughout every generation that's going to twist Paul's writings to their own destruction. We've discovered that Paul's practice concerning the Sabbath is the same as Yeshua's. We've discovered that Paul also continued to keep the feasts even after the resurrection and ascension. And then we want to look at Colossians chapter 2, starting with verse 16. Again, a terribly misinterpreted verse that makes Paul seem to be anti-Torah. Verse 16. Let no one therefore judge you in eating or in drinking or in respect of a festival or a new moon or Sabbaths, which are a shadow of what is to come, but the body of Messiah. So religion will say, that Paul is saying here, let no one judge you for not doing these things. 
Let no one judge you for not keeping festivals, for not keeping the new moon, for not keeping the Sabbaths, all right, which are a shadow of what is to come. So religion will say, well, it's just a shadow. So it's not important to us because we have Messiah now, and Messiah is the substance. And they're twisting this verse to make it say something Paul didn't say. Because Paul is not saying, don't let anyone judge you for not doing these things. What I want to bear out is that Paul is saying, don't let anyone judge you for the manner in which you do these things. Let no one therefore judge you in eating or in drinking. That's talking about celebratory eating and drinking, which took place during festivals and new moon celebrations and Sabbaths. All right. We, we enjoy feasting. That's why they're called feasts. We're supposed to enjoy the food, enjoy the communion with the Almighty, enjoy the family, enjoy the fellowship. Amen. And so Paul is saying, don't let anyone judge you concerning your celebratory eating and drinking or in respect of a festival. In other words, how you keep a festival, the manner in which you keep a festival. Or the manner in which you keep a new moon celebration. That, that's, the new moon is when the new month begins. Or the manner in which you enjoy the Sabbaths. All right? Which are a shadow of what is to come. Again, the law of the shadow is that the shadow continues and is upheld until that which it pictures comes to pass. As I mentioned already, the fall festivals picture Messiah's second coming. It's very important that we understand what's going to happen when he comes back. And the feast teaches us of these things. Amen? Which are a shadow of what is to come, but the body of the Messiah. That can be interpreted a couple of different ways that, that no one makes a judgment. Don't let anybody make a judgment except those who are in the body of Messiah. Or it could also be stating that Messiah is the substance of these things. E either way, it doesn't change the point. And the point is, don't let anybody judge you in the manner in which you celebrate by eating or drinking, the manner in which you celebrate a festival, the manner in which you celebrate new moons or Sabbaths. Verse 18, let no one deprive you of the prize. Messiah is the prize. One who takes delight in false humility. So the one who wants to try to deprive you of the prize is someone who delights in false humility and worship of messengers. So let me ask you a question. Does the Torah anywhere command the worship of angels? So this is not talking about the Torah. This person who wants to deprive you of the prize delights in false humility. He wants you to think he's humble. And he worships angels. And, and these are characteristics of the Gnostics in those days. Those who sought out special gnosis, knowledge. And, and they felt like if they fasted continually and they treated the flesh harshly. And they sought for special knowledge through the worship of angels. That they could receive knowledge from the angels. That would enhance their relationship with the Almighty. So when they're trying to put their doctrine upon the believers of that day and get them to do those things, then of course they're going to be challenging their celebratory eating and drinking because they need to be fasting. They're going to be challenging this wonderful time of, of celebration in the feast and the new moons and the Sabbath because they believe that anything pleasurable in the flesh was evil. And the only way to rise up and to get that special knowledge they needed was to, to fast, to treat their body harshly, and to worship angels. Now, once you know that, then this passage just comes clear for you. Let no one deprive you of the prize, one who takes delight in false humility and worship of angels or messengers, taking his stand on what he has not seen, Puffed up by his fleshly mind. Remember, gnosis, knowledge, fleshly mind. 
Verse 19, and not holding fast to the head, Messiah, from whom all the body nourished and knit together by joints and ligaments grows with the growth of Elohim. If then you died with Messiah from the elementary matters of the world. Now, this is where religion will say this is talking about the Torah. But let me ask you a question. Is the Torah elementary matters of the world? The instructions of the Almighty, are, are they the elementary matters of the world or are they the set apart written word of Elohim? They are the set apart written word of Elohim. And Paul even says the Torah is spiritual. If then you died, verse 20, with Messiah from the elementary matters of the world, why, as though living in the world, do you subject yourself to dogmas? That word dogma means laws and commandments of men, man-made rules and regulations, not the holy spiritual laws or instructions of the Almighty found in the Torah. Why, as though living in the world, do you subject yourselves to dogmas? Now, these are the dogmas or the commandments of the Gnostics. Do not touch, do not taste, do not handle. Again, if you're one who believes that all pleasure in the flesh is evil and, and you need to treat your body harshly and fast all the time and seek special knowledge and worship angels, then your dogma is that you're not to touch, you're not to taste, and you're not to handle. Nothing pleasurable in the flesh. Verse 22, which are all to perish with use according to the commandments or the commands and teachings of men. Do you see it? These dogmas are going to perish. They're according to the commandments and teachings of men. So the do not touch, do not taste, do not handle were commandments and teachings of men, not the written word of Elohim. Verse 23, these indeed have an appearance of wisdom in self-imposed worship, humiliation and harsh treatment of the body. These are all things the Gnostics did. Of no value at all, only for the satisfaction of the flesh. In other words, there's no spiritual value in all of this. They're doing it just to satisfy their, their flesh. And so you see in Colossians chapter 2, this is one of the most horribly misinterpreted verses that make it seem like Paul was anti-Torah, that he was anti-festivals, that he was anti-Sabbaths, and that's one of the most common places where religious people will, will take you to say that Paul abolished all those things, or at least he gave the latitude for you to decide whether or not you want to do those things. And, and if you don't want to do them, then don't let anybody judge you for not doing them. Well, and that's where religion is gone. You don't find the other case. You don't find the, the, the one in religion who says, not very often at least, the one in, in religion who says, I just want to do these things. Not in religion. Oh, no, we don't do those things because Paul said, don't let anybody judge you for not doing those things. Amen? So Paul wasn't saying, don't let anybody judge you for not doing these things. He was saying, don't let anyone judge you in the manner in which you do these things.